actually titled this when I didn't even know what my speech was about, so <laughs> I've changed it since. Hmm. Oh, sorry about that. Um, many of you guys know me, if you do know me, as the TikToker that went to Ukraine. The guy that rescued a fox here in Poland, and the guy that's been living in his van for the past two years, traveling the world, making videos. If you don't know me, hi, my name is Philip Vu, and I'm from a place you probably have never heard of, a small state on the western side of America called California. <laughs> um, to be honest, I didn't really want to be here today because I get a little nervous in front of people. And also, the last time I was in Warsaw, I got punched in the head and someone stole my hat. <laughs> um, but after a small conversation with my friend Luke, he convinced me. When I got an Instagram DM to do this TED Talk, I thought to myself, there's no possible way they're recruiting TED Talkers to, through IG DMs. <laughs> um, today's theme is breaking barriers. Uh, usually TED Talks are from people in academia using research and studies to prove whatever point they're trying to make. But for me, I am not a scientist, nor am I an engineer, nor a doctor like my mom wanted me to be. I'm simply a storyteller. So today I want to share a few stories to help me transcend my limiting beliefs to live a fulfilling life. Oh, I'm not even clicking this at this point. <laughs> I don't know what's going on here, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, <laughs> we got this meme and we decided online. But uh, when I was 16 years old, I applied to 12 different universities. And you guys can't tell, I'm Asian, and so my mom is a very strict mother. Um, when I was in grade school, I got a 90% on the test. I thought I did really well, but my mom didn't agree with me, so that night she brought out the bamboo stick. <laughs> um, I struggled a lot in grade school, and so when high school came around, I knew I needed to study hard again to university. So I put my head down and I grinded. And when college admissions came, I got rejected by all 12 universities. To be honest, I actually spent most of my time in grade school doing drugs. <laughs> What does that say? Point clicker, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, honestly, for me, my breaking point was when I was doing Xanax in class and they found me passed out in a pool of drool. My mom, she gave up on me and I conveniently ran away. I was living out of my car at the time at 16 years old and I kind of didn't believe I had a future. I got a call one day, and on the other side of the phone was the police. It turns out my dad had called me in his runaway, and that day I got escorted home in the back of a police car. It turns out my dad had called the police on me, and, well, my dad, he's probably the best human being I've ever met. given up on this, guys. <laughs> um, you know, no matter how many times I screwed up in my life, my dad was always there for me. He was probably the smartest person I ever met. He was a PhD electrical engineer with 12 different patents in multi-layer fiber optic cables. He tried to teach me how to use semiconductors when I was 12 years old. It didn't work at all. My dad, um, my life changed when my dad got diagnosed with cancer. My life went from getting high with my friends every single day to living in a hospital room with just me, my dad, and five megabits per second Wi-Fi speed that barely ran my online community college classes. But even on my dad's deathbed, he really challenged me. He pushed me to go to university, get educated, to chase love, to see the world. A few months later, my Dad actually got accepted into the UC Irvine Hall of Fame for engineering. I was the one there to accept his award because unfortunately he passed a few months prior. At the time I felt like I lost 
the most important person in my life, the person that, the only person that actually believed in me. But around the same time, I got my report card with the first one ever straight A's, and that pushed me to keep going. After that, I, two years later, I was actually able to transfer to my dream school at UCLA, and two years after that, I got to have the greatest moment of my life. I walked across that stage with my diploma in hand, realizing that I finally was able to make my dad proud. If you want to change your life, you have to find the right people. And for me, that unfortunately meant getting rid of the people around me that made me the worst version of myself. Um, so the other day, I was on a date with a girl. <laughs> and she asked me, if you had all the money in the world, and you could be anywhere, where would you go and what would you do? And for me, I told her, Something pretty cheesy, I said, I would be right here in this moment with you. And honestly, that was the truth. And because I'm pretty lucky, I get to do social media, so I can kind of do whatever I want, whenever I want. So I want to share a story of how I started social media. Probably something your age range is a lot more interested in. So for me, when I started social media, I was really nervous about what I was doing. Um, <laughs> I was worried about my family, my peers, my coworkers. They'd all see my videos. But death has been a big motivating factor for me in realizing that I don't want my life's actions to be a consequences of other people's opinions. So what to make videos about? Well, at the time, I had just been arrested for protesting. By the way, they dropped the charges. I'm not a felon. But um, I, that's what I decided to make my videos on. I made my videos on racial injustice, fighting for women's rights, and flaws in the American police system. And I had actually a lot of early success. But after a few months, I was like miserable. And that's mostly because I realized that I was passionate about these subjects, but I didn't want to be an authority figure lecturing people. So I had to switch niches. And that's a pretty big cardinal sin in social media, switching from one niche to another niche. I'd say the worst thing you can do when starting social media is going viral in something you don't want to make long term. So I started making videos about something completely different. I thought to myself, what videos do I want to make and what audience do I really want to reach? I wanted to make videos about my authentic human experience and I wanted my audience to be interested in human connection. So I spontaneously quit my job and moved into my car to make TikToks and I wanted to document the people I met around the world. And my first six months on social media, oh, sorry about that, <laughs> looked like this. I actually gained 80,000 followers in six months, which is crazy to me. But when I switched niches, it slowed like crazy at first. And I thought to myself, well, how do I get around this? I stopped posting every single day, and I really started to focus on the quality. So I was posting TikToks every single day, and I switched to making only one video every week. And so then my growth looked like this. We went from 80,000 followers to 400,000 followers, which is crazy to me. The next six months, I posted even less, actually, probably once every two weeks, and we went from 400,000 to ah, 1 million followers, which is like, mind-blowing to me. And then. In the next six months after that, I actually took like a three month mental health break. And even despite that, we grew to two million followers, which is mind blowing. In the past year, we've uh, kind of diversified. And so this is uh, what my current social media status is, me flexing on high schoolers high. <laughs> I think the coolest thing about social media though is that we made the videos about me. So if I need to take a break, I can do it. So if you want to be successful in social media, you got to find the right people. And for me, that meant making videos that actually connected with the audience I wanted. <laughs> if you didn't know, my parents are both war refugees from Vietnam. Um, this next photo is a photo of me and my mom this year actually in Hong Kong, which is like a big deal because at 16 years old, my mom escaped Vietnam on a small boat. The small boat would actually get to the bigger boat 
and that big boat would finally take her to Hong Kong. But unfortunately, the big boat never came. That's because the big boat got gunned down. And my mom at 16 years old had to hide on her small boat as she heard the screams of her own countrymen. It wasn't until another four months till my mom was able to make it to Hong Kong. She told me she got seasick the entire time. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was just the start of her journey because after four months, my mom had to then wait in Hong Kong in a refugee camp for four years. After those four years, she finally came to America where she said she cried every single day because she got sent to Colorado and she had never seen snow before. She had only read about it in textbooks. Hearing my parents' stories, all I wanted to do was ever just to heal their inner child. And so when my dad asked me what I wanted to change about the world, I was 18 at the time. I had no idea, but I kind of have an idea now. It's just to ease world suffering. And so when the war in Ukraine broke out, well, I knew I wanted to do something. And luckily, we had a small little successful history. My first year on social media, we met this guy, Mike. Um, at the time, I was actually living out of my car. Mike came up to me and tried to clean my window. Unfortunately, I didn't have any money to give him because I was living out of my car at the time. So I invited him into my home for sandwiches. The internet and TikTok loved Mike. And we were able to raise $17,000 to get him into stable housing, actually. The next year, we met my friend Luke. Luke got diagnosed with cancer at the age of 24. He actually went to my high school, and we became friends when I heard his story. His mom had passed away, his dad also had cancer, and now he had cancer. The internet again fell in love with Luke, and we were able to raise $22,000 for his medical expenses. Medical expenses in America are kind of expensive. <laughs> I actually moved back to California for three months, basically moved in with Luke, and I took care of him. And in that time, we actually became best friends. So, with the war in Ukraine, I didn't have any experience with humanitarian work at all. But we were able to make a little bit of change in the world using my platform. So I flew straight to Poland, rented a car, bought a bunch of groceries, and started giving out sandwiches at the border. <sighs> During the time, you know, I was just making videos, and people saw the videos, I got connected with an org, and I started driving refugees from the Ukrainian border straight to their new homes in Poland. And through social media, I actually got connected with these guys, Mark and Dylan, they are kind of have the same idea as me. They both left their home, or they left their jobs in America, to come volunteer, they started an organization called Mission for Ukraine, and I started working with them, making the videos together. They deserve the majority of the credit, by the way, but together we've raised almost a million dollars as a day, which is mind-blowing to me. Throughout the videos, I got to meet and get connected to a lot of other works and meet a bunch of amazing people. People like Anya, who is a PhD student here in Warsaw, who every single weekend would go to the border to run a warehouse. Or people like Chris and Julia, who are the most insane people I've ever met. They work with Renegade Relief Runners, and they actually hand deliver supplies to the most critical areas in Ukraine. I went with them to near the Russian border, a few villages outside of Kharkiv, and through the destruction, I got to see a lot of hope. The thousands of faces that we're raising the money for to ease their suffering. Well, if you want to change the world, you have to find the right people. And I think the coolest thing is that we're able to use TikTok, which is like an app that everyone makes fun of. It's an app for kids doing like the renegade and stuff. Well, we're able to connect with people thousands of miles through a little screen and we're able to make a little bit of real world change. Um, on May 26th, 2022, I was woken up by air sirens, which is really normal in Kharkiv. But actually, you hear sirens every single day, multiple times a day. But today was a little bit different because every 15 minutes, there are explosions 
The team I was with decided to consolidate, and so we decided to take refuge in a restaurant. And as I got to the restaurant and I opened my van door, there was an explosion so loud that my ears went deaf. There was chaos everywhere. I, um, there was buildings on fire. There were people on the ground crying. There was shrapnel flying everywhere. I tried to help up this lady that was twice as far from the explosion as me, and as I grabbed her up, I saw her clothes pull up in blood. She had been hit by shrapnel. My friend Chris, he had to amputate a man's leg to try to get him. Um, nine people died in this explosion, and 19 people were wounded. And I don't think I'll ever kind of unsee what I saw. <sighs> Afterwards, unfortunately, because of the situation with the shrapnel, our vans were destroyed, or the, shrap the starters. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but throughout the situation, we were put, we were evacuated by the military into a safe house. We were there for four days, waiting for the explosions to end. And then after that, we were evacuated out of the country. For me, I, I struggled a lot afterwards, but for the past year I've been in therapy, kind of trying to, you know, learn a new, <laughs> learn a new version of myself. But throughout this experience, I got to be much closer to my best friend Luke. He was on the previous slide. Luke, he, um, this past year, his cancer went terminal. And so we've talked about, a lot about our regrets before death. And in the last year, just to hammer this point home one more time, Luke, he, uh, the part that broke my heart the most was on a recent call with him, he told me that since his cancer has become terminal, in the past year, none of his old friends visited him. Luke is actually the one that convinced me to do this TED Talk, and last month we flew back to California for a celebration of life. And I'd like to believe that Though his old friends didn't see him, Luke died peacefully knowing that his new friends truly loved him. And so yeah, if I could leave you guys with one thing from this TED Talk, it would be, you only have a finite amount of time in this world, make sure you invest it in the right people. Thank you.